The Deziban Provincian was the sole member of its class, and possibly of its type. Why so? It fell between the cruiser and coast defence ship types, which makes it somewhat unique. A cruiser, of course, has to go places far from home, and usually at high speed, whereas a coast defence ship almost always stays in home waters and can sacrifice many features of an ocean-going ship in aid of better operations in shallow environments. The Dutch, however, faced a conundrum. On the one hand, they had a colonial empire, mostly in the Pacific area. On the other hand, there was almost nothing else that they owned between there and home, and relatively tight finances meant that constructing a full ocean-going fleet was going to be too expensive, at least at the time, and the Medway was unfortunately much better guarded these days, which ruled out the other tried-and-true method of expanding the Dutch capital ship fleet. And so, whilst everybody else was ordering their first dreadnoughts, the Dutch ordered a vessel that was about 6,500 tonnes, which was considerably larger than most protected or lightly armoured cruisers, but also smaller than most armoured cruisers or battleships, and which carried an unusual armament. The main battery consisted of two single 283mm or 11.1 inch guns, one turret forward and one aft, in a manner similar to a number of full-on coast defence battleships from a decade earlier. A secondary battery of four 150mm or 5.9 inch guns mounted on single sponsons supporting a small turret that was nonetheless positioned much like a casemate. Ten single open mounted 75mm and four similarly positioned 37mm guns made up the rest of the direct battery, along with a single 75mm mortar which reflected her colonial objectives. Unusually, no torpedo tubes were mounted. Two propeller shafts used 8,000 shaft horsepower to reach a relatively pedestrian 16 knots. While she was generally protected by a 2 inch thick deck and a 5.9 inch thick belt, the barbettes, conning tower, and turrets all had better protection at varying levels of thickness. She would be laid down in 1908, launched in 1909, and commissioned in 1910, giving the Royal Netherlands Navy a ship that was the size of a large light cruiser, had the speed of a slow crew dreadnought, a weapons outfit similar to that of a second class battleship or coast defence battleship, the main armour protection of an armoured cruiser, although the armour of the main guns was more akin to the aforementioned capital ships, and a role that was primarily local defence but required transoceanic voyages. So, as you can see, pretty unique. In November 1910, she would leave the port of Den Helder for the Dutch East Indies. Foregoing the Suez Canal for the longer South African route, she would arrive in the Dutch East Indies at the start of 1911. Her career up to and during World War I was relatively uneventful due to Dutch neutrality, with the minor exception of hitting a rock in 1912 and escorting some Dutch shipping in the latter half of the war to prevent their seizure. With those duties accomplished, she completed a somewhat delayed around-the-world tour by heading out across the Pacific, through the Panama Canal, and back to Den Helder, seeing home soil again for the first time in almost a decade in April 1919, after which she went into a deep refit to prefer prepare her for another long stint overseas. Two and a half years later, in November 1921, she headed back out again, although now instead of something of a centrepiece for the Dutch fleet in colonial waters, she was now to be largely a gunnery training ship, as well as occasional stints as an active warship, as technology had moved on and the capabilities of warships were now considerably more advanced, with the flagship roles now due to be served by the new Java-class cruisers, which were then under construction. In 1933, this relatively calm tropical existence was broken by a mutiny, whose cause is still widely debated, with everything from general unrest to poor naval morale to pay cuts, bad working conditions, and communists all being blamed. Although, of course, it's entirely possible that it was a combination of some or all of these. When the mutineers refused to back down, the Dutch government launched an, at an attack on the ship with a mixed group of flying boats and land-based bombers. Ostensibly, the idea was to try and scare the crew into submission with some loud explosions, but whether this was the case, or this was just justification after the fact, one of the flying boats scored a direct hit which killed 23 men, and prompted an immediate surrender by the rest of them. 
The combination of mutiny by an active vessel of the armed services and the dramatic conclusion of the incident apparently had a significant impact back home, causing a large shift towards the right wing of Dutch politics, and once the Dutch dust had settled, uh, the ship was taken out of service, renamed the Sorabaja, and designated as a full-time training ship. This freed up the name for a new class of cruiser that was then planned for construction. Although still fairly well protected and very heavily armed for a cruiser, she was too slow to be considered for service in the ABDA command and was therefore not included in the task force that was sent out to fight the Battle of the Java Sea. But in the end, this didn't save her, as a few days before that engagement she was bombed and sunk in port by Japanese aircraft. Since she was in shallow water, the Japanese would later refloat the ship for their own uses, but this would only last for about a year before an Allied airstrike would send her to the bottom again, and this time for good, in 1943. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.